Hi, welcome to the Light of Deception. Today we're going to be talking about virtual gardens. So why are they making gardens in a virtual way inside these warehouses? What is happening with farming? What is happening with our food? What is happening with the destruction of those things? Why is there so much of it being bought up? What is going on that we would bring food manufacturing for our vegetables and fruits indoors? And what does that mean? What kind of lighting, the LD lights, will it take to make these things really grow? And are they going to be all kinds of things added into these things inside these warehouses? Are they going to be like the natural sun? We used to, you know, we were using the soil and the seeds and, you know, we we're growing and those kind of things. And how can we do it in a virtual way and indoors? And why is that taking over in the taking people maybe out of the suburbs into the city and these things are coming up in the cities and they say they're going to be up in the rural areas, right? They're bringing one up in Compton right now. They're going to be, but the problem is, is you have this huge warehouse and you really don't need a whole lot of people to work there, maybe a hundred because you have machines and robots and type of these kind of things doing it for you. So that wouldn't open up a whole lot of jobs and would well, actually take jobs away from farmers. So what in the world is going on? I want you to watch this. So pods are where we do almost all of our environmental research. This is where we understand, you know, what drives flavor, what drives appearance, what drives yield in all of the different crops that we grow. Why would we want to farm vertically? Well, there's a reason that libraries don't spread their books all over the floor. They stack them up on shelves so that they can stack a lot of books in a small footprint. Vertical farms do the same thing for agriculture. And while vertical farms are not new, Companies like Plenty are leading the charge at making them mainstream. Okay, this is Nate's story, Plenty. So going vertical allows us to put a lot more product in a single spot. It allows us to circulate air easier, administer light easier, it allows us to have massive growing planes. We can condense about 700 acres of farmland into the size of a big box retail store. And we harvest 365 days a year. We are able to condense the growth cycle to about 10 days for a lot of our products, which is about a 700% increase in yield. We are doing that all while saving about a million gallons of water per week and using about 1% of the land compared to traditional farming. In an indoor farm, we put water in the root zone, they take the water up, they transpire that water, and then that water gets sucked into our air handling units. We condense it all and put it right back in the system. So 99% of the water that's transpired in the field and lost is captured and uh, recirculated in our, in our farms. We have, you know, strawberries in another space. We've got an upstairs space devoted to tomatoes. Overall, we've got over 50 different, uh, you know, discrete spaces that we use to do these tests. Historically, vertical farming has been too expensive and too inefficient to make it a better option than traditional farming. But that's all changing now as these technologies drop in price. Humanity is on that cost curve right now. We just don't realize it, right? We're riding this cost curve down to a future where almost anything is possible in an extremely controlled environment. That's not to say one of these vertical farms is cheap. A new facility can cost $100 million to install. But the cost of each component is plummeting as industries like solar and robotics are flourishing. But the surprising technology that's helped make this possible is LEDs, what vertical farms use to replicate the sun. Let's break that down. Our system is just a system of energy transfers. And our ability to manage the efficiency of those energy transfers in some way or another is what makes us economical or non-economical as a business. It sounds crazy but like most everything in the world, right? Like we can only save our species if it makes economic sense. <laughs> you know, life and death, uh, let's make sure that we can afford it, right? Right, Nate gets it. Basically, an LED's efficiency comes down to how little loss there is between the grid's electricity and the amount of light it puts out. Then how much light is actually absorbed and used by the plant. We think about LEDs as like the point of major energy loss in the system. We're taking electrons and converting them into photons. And thanks to all your TV and cell phone and light bulb buying, LED technology has gotten really, really efficient. And Plenty is getting really good at putting out the kind of light that actually results in plant growth and plant flavor. 
LEDs have just been going down, down, down in price and up, up, up in efficiency. And our understanding of what makes a good photon versus a bad photon at the plant level has been going up, up, up as we've been researching and working. We're really kind of transitioning into a world where humans and machines are partnering together in better and better ways to make farming awesome. Does this look like our future? Does this look like um, it's going to add jobs? Does this look like it's going to be, what is it going to do with the future moving forward? How are they going to implement this? What is going to happen to our food? What is going to have to happen to our food supply first? What is going to be happen, going to be happening outside to cause everybody to come inside to do virtual gardening? What is going on? So I do have another video here. It's called Dig It. So it's got this new global food system must watch. And it is an absolute must watch. So I'm going to do segments of this as well. So here it comes right here. The Codex program, what they're referring to here on international standards. So now this is from uh, what we're looking at here is the USDA's. 2019 to 2023 new plan on codex program and i'm going to read you just their brief description on what you know codex is so through the u.s codex program the united states participates in the work of the international codex alimentarius commission which was established in 1963 by the united nations food and agriculture organization fao and the world health organization uh, with a mandate to protect consumer health and ensure fair trade practices through the development of international food standards that are based on science. The CAC is also charged with promoting international coordination and harmonization of food standards. The CAC bases its work on the advice of independent international expert scientific bodies convened by FAO and WHO. So, just so you understand the basis of where this comes from and how long this has been going on. And look, again, it's necessary. We need a management system. When you're importing, when you're exporting, it's important we have some regulations in place, obviously, so that we have um, healthy foods out there. It's, it's how they're pushing the control over, who they're pushing it to, and how they can take these standards and make them international and what they're going to change along the way with these standards. Okay. That's what concerns me. Right. So, so what does this mean for the local farmer, the local grocer, for a, a homesteader, uh, producer, for, for anybody, uh, in, you know, these, the, the little guy who's trying to um, subvert this system of food control, what does it mean for them? The Codex Alimentarius is a partnership between the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, and the World Health Organization, WHO. Its science-based standards ensure that food is safe, while providing a reliable basis upon which to trade. All 188 member nations benefit, from the smallest to the world's largest economy, the United States which often provides the data upon which codex standards are based. The U.S. imports a great deal of food from other countries, and the fact that codex standards are in place enables us to have greater assurance that the foods we import will have been produced in a safe manner and handled in accordance with safe handling practices. We also benefit because we are a major agricultural exporter. The fact that codex standards are out there opens up markets to our agricultural exporters so they help us from a trade perspective as well okay so i was just showing so this is codex alimentarius right this is published by the fao who the codex group and they this is from 2018 and here they are promoting bill gates is working with geneticists to create the perfect cow and he had donated 40 million toward research efforts to breed a cow that can produce more milk and survive in hot climates. So these people are so intertwined. Right. I just, Co I just, Codex apparently has no, no problem with the standards of genetically modifying all of our food. I mean, that's right. Exactly. That, that's just fine. <laughs> Exactly. But they're going to have something to say if you grow something on your homestead or your, um, your small little farm, right? 
<laughs> right, right. Or, you know, you don't have intellectual property rights to those seeds. What are you doing? Oh, there will be no sharing of those seeds. The WHO Global Strategy for Food Safety. Okay, this yep. is their draft that they have put together that um, <laughs> is, is the strategy from 2022 through 2030. And I haven't had time to review all of this, so I just want to read two very key sections. This is a 56-page document. Society changing expectations and behavior around food. That's the subheader. Social megatrends are a common phenomenon in today's interconnected world. Shifts in consumer preferences, purchasing trends and expectations are rapidly changing the production and distribution of certain foods, e.g. demand in some populations for organic, fresh and less processed foods and demand for alternative protein sources. Moreover, New business models, including e-commerce and food deliveries, are emerging to meet the needs of consumers. From the communication side, social media platforms provide new opportunities for risk communication and education regarding food safety. However, the difficulty is distinguishing facts from misleading information can lead to a loss of consumers' trust in food sectors and governments. Okay, so... They're very concerned about controlling the narrative on what we're talking about right now. Well, good thing we have have... a ministry of truth now, so we can control that (laughs) darn misinformation. (laughs) Right. And then we have the rise of new technologies and digital transformation. The pace of innovation in food and agriculture is increasing, bringing significant economic advantages to food production and benefits to consumers through increased product choice and a reduction in food waste. Novel plant and animal breeding methods involving genetic editing offer the potential for developing species with new traits, such as disease resistant and drought tolerance. Nanotechnology applications in the food sector can lead to improvements in nutrients, bioactive delivery systems, and novel food packaging materials, which can extend the shelf life of foods. Alternative food proteins, such as meat, egg, fishery, or dairy products that are plant-based, cultivated, or fermentation-derived, and other new food sources, such as live-grown meat, including food product reformulation, reformulation, can improve consumer options and sustainability. However, new technologies for food production must be fully assessed from a public health point of view before products are placed on the market. Sure they will. In this regard, the Codex Alimentarius will play a key role in addressing the emerging and critical issues related to the usage of new technologies in a timely manner. Some new technologies require considerable investment in research and development and may be out of the reach of lower income countries, which would create an equity gap in innovation and ability to detect hazards. Digital innovation and transformation in the context of big data and analytics, artificial intelligence, and the Internet of Things are trends that are rapidly changing food systems. For example, genomics and related tools such as whole genome or next generation sequencing and international sharing of data relevant to foodborne diseases enable more precise focused investigations, including pathogen detection, characterization, identification, and source tracking. So that pretty much sums up the whole last 20 minute nut of what we've been talking about, validating our theory on how, how they wanna move forward and how they plan to control it and how they do in fact plan to use the Codex Alimentarius to um, address these new <laughs> systems basically they want in place. To basically and- track and control every piece of food in order to be able to control the entire global population. Mm-hmm. And how are they going to do that? Well, with every way that they can using new technologies. Wow, right? So with everything else going on in the world, now they're going to control the food supply. Well, they have to if they're going to control everything. So this is a good way. I'm going to give put to the link at the bottom. You, it would, I would ask you that you watch all of this so you can see they put a pretty good report together. It is a little bit lengthy, but I wanted to give you snapshots so you can go down and see it for yourself. And then it says that they will stop at nothing to accelerate their control. 
plus additional connections made after the report published. You don't want to miss it. So then there's all kinds of information here. They have all the resources here for you to see as well. And what does our lives look like moving forward? How important is it for us to either have our own supply of food, our own type gardening going on? And some people are thinking about doing some kind of maybe virtual gardening a little bit in like a in a place that they have just because they're not sure what they're going to be putting in the air why are these things um how are they going to get people to come along with this how are they going to get people to not farm on their own lands are they going to buy it all up or are they going to you know burn up these resources all over the place right these warehouses how are what are they going to do to get us to come along with the sterilization and a different way of we did gmos right so now we're moving over to another aspect of what are they going to be doing to our food can we trust them to be doing what's best for us or what's best for them what is their plan is it darkness is it do they say it's to help is it to help is it really to help let's close with this during the 1990s, Monsanto Corporation's devastating attack against farmers, their genetically modified frankenfoods, and their neurotoxic pesticides inspired people to push government into legislating certification standards for foods. But thanks to Big Pharma, Bill Gates, and pop culture media brainwashing, Monsanto still stands strong and is ready to take complete control of your food supply. With the help of the same powerful families and foundations who already control the money and the energy. Their plans to do so are comprehensively laid out in a recent report published at Cory Diggs. The indoor vertical farming industry, which is a highly innovative and efficient method, is being funded by Bill Gates and pushed by the World Economic Forum as a replacement to conventional outdoor farming. Aero Farms is the industry leader in vertical farming, and they also co-developed the first CRISPR gene-edited produce product and worked with the NIH to produce proteins for the deadly COVID vaccines. Aero Farms makes it clear that they are not conventional gardeners. They are all about synthetic food products, which is clearly the trend in this growing industry. Monsanto is creating specially tailored genetically cut seeds for these vertical farms. And the University of California is developing a plant-based mRNA vaccine that farms can grow in heads of lettuce, which happens to be the main crop of these new farms. These GMO farms already provide food at major outlets, including Kroger, Walmart, and Whole Foods, and are massively expanding. And it's not only fresh produce that's getting genetically modified. The USDA and FDA have already approved genetic modifications on pigs, salmon, and cattle. And they have approved synthetic lab-grown meat. Bill Gates's Good Food Institute plans to reimagine meat production with $10 million of support from the USDA. But in order to make their big pharma food supply the new American model, they will need a major crisis. The 2020 lockdowns distressed the supply chain, which was further affected by U.S. sanctions against Russia. This has created a food shortage crisis. Add to that, over a dozen food processing plants have mysteriously been destroyed in the past several weeks, as well as major fertilizer plants during a major fertilizer crisis. To make matters worse, Union Pacific Railroad forces a 20% reduction in shipments from the world's largest fertilizer company. And when the people demand a solution, as it turns out, Bill Gates is heavily invested in alternative fertilizers and is also a chief stockholder of the Canadian National Railway, who claims to be helping the fertilizer market grow. Perhaps Bill Gates and Monsanto will volunteer to save everyone with their new gene-edited bacteria fertilizer. And maybe it will backfire like it did in Africa, when after 15 years of trying to help, 
all Gates and Monsanto accomplished was increasing starvation by 31%. But that's okay, because it's Monsanto Bear to the rescue with their big pharma food factories, with brand new mRNA vaccine lettuce. And as if this wasn't bad enough, the stated goal of this new Franken food industry is to make all food traceable. And that means coating it all in nanotech. Who controls the food supply controls the people. Who controls the energy can control whole continents. Who controls money can control the world. I hope this helps you and it starts to help you to think, um, maybe I need a prep, not crazy prep. I mean, we don't wanna be doing bunkers and stuff, right? But we wanna make sure we're smart. We wanna make sure that we're ready just in case something happens and you know the supermarkets are already low and, and different things. and. We have um, obviously problems getting some of the simplest things in the store now. And um, is it gonna get worse? Are we gonna have a, a time where we can't go get stuff from the supermarket? We can't get um, what we need and to provide for our families. And we're gonna, maybe this is um, their way of control. If they can control the people, they control, the, they, if you can't eat, they, they have control over you. So if they control the food, they control the education, they control the government, they control everything. How are they gonna do it? They have to do something to scare you. They have to do something to tell you that you're not safe. They have to do something to control your in, your intake and they're gonna say it. it's gonna be healthier some ways or, or I don't know how they're gonna do it. But they know how to use fear to get control over mankind. They also know how to brainwash. They also make it sound like they're doing something good that you need to come along and help them out. Right, but what's really going into this food? What are they going to do with it? That's a good thing to think about. I hope this helps. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye.